the title for today is Imagining the Church as an Iconoclastic Revolution. And now we need to define some terms. Because a lot of folk don't use the word iconoclastic in day-to-day -day conversation. It means an idol breaker. An icon is anything, whether it's a painting, a statue, or just an object that is a, um, an avatar of an idol, a, um, a god, a deity, any of these things. And then a kind of clasm means the act of breaking down idols. When I was a boy, I got to see some ruins, not to the extent that our brother Ray got to see them here recently. Uh, but I have an alibi. I didn't do it. Uh, I know that much for sure. But whenever I would go in and see these, one of the first questions I had as a boy was, why are all the arms broken? Why are the heads missing from so many? And the answer was, whenever an invading army would come in, one of the first things they wanted to do was to take away your protection, your gods. And so when they found your idols they would break the arms of the gods so that those gods no longer had arms to reach out. And many times they'd take the head off to decapitate your gods. They, it was active iconoclasm every time you invaded a new area. You went after their gods to remove their protection. Now, many of you may not know this, but if you come to Nashville, Tennessee, you can see a not full-scale, but pretty big version of the Parthenon. However, the difference is that in our Parthenon, not only is it a bit smaller, there's a full-size, fully equipped, heavily painted Artemis or Diana there. I remember the first time I saw it, I thought, this just looks totally wrong. And then it dawned on me, it's because it still has a head and arms. Normally, that's the first thing an invading army would do. And because Europe being very close in, they're invading armies all the time, it's really hard to find an idol with its arms or a head still there. A conoclasm is not something you normally think of when you think of Christianity. Christianity is conservative. Nothing changes here. Don't rock the boat. Get in line. Discipline yourself. Look like the rest of the people. Conform. You get the idea. But truly, there's nothing more iconoclastic than Christianity. Nothing is kicked over as many idols. Nothing is broken as many rules as Christianity, even the unbreakable rules. And I would submit to you that if you're doing Christianity right in our day and age, you are an iconoclast that is not welcome in greater society because you kick over the idols that they have set up to worship. Whenever you remove God from the center of your life, you don't stop worshiping. You just change the object of your worship. You don't stop believing. You just change what you believe. So, People today will worship their sexuality. They will worship weird, twisted ideas about economics or about power, about war. And they worship these things without a God. And then when we come along and we say, no, we will not participate in this. We do not do that. We stand here. We are a danger. Think of this. I don't watch award shows for a lot of reasons. One, I don't know those people and I haven't seen the movies or the plays and I don't know the songs. That's a big motivator right there for me not to watch. But whenever I've watched the snippets, people will step up and they will do a little political speech or something and people will applaud. You know what the most dangerous thing you could possibly say is? To walk up and say, I believe in God and in Jesus Christ as his son our Messiah. I believe in the sanctity of marriage. I believe in purity of heart. And I believe in doing good to all people, regardless of who they are. You would be roundly booed out of the room. And yet, when somebody says what everybody else is already believing in the room, people will say, oh, they're so brave. And I'm going, no. That's like a, like a lion going into the lion's den. There was no danger there. But a Christian in school, 
All of you who are in school know this, that if you stand up for your faith in school, you are not going to be welcome because you are kicking over idols. Think of the list of things Christianity has destroyed. The list of things that Christianity has just broken. The idea of women as property, you will find that in every culture that you go through. I know people talk about, oh, the Amazonian women. That's a myth. It was made up by Plato. It didn't happen. The women were subjugated. Women's rights were taken away. Women had no rights in, in marriage and many other things. There were exceptions for brief periods of times in certain cultures, but women were viewed upon as property or lesser than, and then comes Jesus. Ask Jesus what he thinks about women. And then attack women who have fallen into sin and ta- attack their sin and attack their character. Ask Jesus how he treated the sex worker in Luke 7, how he treated the Samaritan woman, how he treated the woman caught in adultery, how he treated all these women. Look at that. Slavery has existed in every society since the world began, except those that Christianity has permeated. And then slavery was broken. Ask Jesus about the value of a single human life. Rome had no value of a single human right uh, life, and they had no concept of human rights. None. They had a concept of citizen rights, but even those were strictly gradiated, whether you bought your citizenship or born into citizenship, etc. The idea that a person, by the, the, very, the very fact that they were born, has rights, was completely unknown in Rome. How about the value of human life? All we have to do is look at any war. See, Napoleon lining up his men to march them forward. Did he care about those men as individuals when the cannonballs slashed through them? No. He cared about his power. And we could say the same thing, not only about Napoleon, but about almost every war which has ever been conducted. Ask Jesus what he thinks of the value of a single human life. Ask Jesus if he thinks an individual has rights and should be treated with dignity and honor. His answer has always been the opposite of the world until he wins that world or a portion of the world and women are elevated. Women are no longer denigrated where people are free from slavery, where people are called to love, not war, He is an iconoclast, and those who follow him will be be breaking society as they fix society. I often think of the poem Ozymandias. I have quoted it here before. Um, I don't feel the need that I need to go through it all today. But Percy Bysshe Shelley wrote a, a poem about walking in this vast desert and there was nothing there. No power, nothing, no city. And then he came upon the bottom part of a statue. Only the legs, portions of the legs and feet remained. It, remained. And there was an inscription. And the inscription, the inscription said, look upon this. I am Ozymandias. I am the greatest leader and king of all times. Nations bow before me. The world shudders in front of me. Look upon my works and weep. And he said he looked around and saw nothing but sand. God breaks down idols. Fallen stars that used to be highly regarded and are now shunned. Disgraced politicians, broken, forgotten celebrities, jobs lost, economies shattered, even our own bodies eventually fail us. Everything fades away except Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who doesn't need a statue. His people are his temple. Think about the world Jesus entered that night in Bethlehem. And the world he encountered after he left the desert, being tempted of the devil. And then he climbs the Mount of Olives, sits down, and delivers what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Think about that for a moment, and let me ask you a question. 
Have you read the first five books of the Bible? I know it sounds a silly question because many of you are church people. And many of you have read the Bible frequently. But I was with a fellow. I don't do this to people. Uh, but I was with a fellow who sprung surprises on elders that I was with sometimes. And he would look at them and say, can you name the Ten Commandments in order? And you would look upon these church leaders and they'd be going, uh, uh, and they'd usually come up with almost all of them, but they couldn't get them in order. They'd read their Bibles many times. So let me ask you again, have you really read the first five books of your Bible? Some of it's quite exciting. Genesis and Exodus in particular have a lot of sex, drugs, and rock and roll in them. It's a lot of fun. And then you hit Leviticus, Numbers, And you keep thinking it's going to get better. You hit Deuteronomy, a little bit better, but it's still rough. We love the stories of the heroes and the bad guys, but the tedious, continual, this is how we sacrifice, this is what we wear, this is what you plant, this is what you eat, that um, that gets very tiring to us. Our, Our attention span has a struggle keeping up with that. But for a thousand years or more, That was the only way to approach God. The only way was through Genesis, Exodus, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The only way to ever get forgiveness was to go through all of these 600 plus laws. And then the customs that they threw on top of that. Nobody could imagine any other way of living in a relationship with God. Nobody could imagine another way of having community. This is the way, period, end of discussion. And then Jesus came. The Lamb of God was from the very first an iconoclast, a revolutionary. And he did not hesitate to make that known in his first recorded sermon, sat there on the Mount of Olives. He started by standing the world on its head. Through the Beatitudes, he broke the system, declaring it null and void. And by the way, give Mary her full due. In her prayer, when she found out she was pregnant with God's son, the Magnificat, we usually call it, she said, he will tear down kings. He will elevate the poor. He will destroy the systems. And Jesus came out of the gate doing exactly that. He declared that his people were blessings, but they were also irritants. They were salt and light. They were supposed to cause disruption in the world. They do not swim with the flow. They do not bow down to culture. They do not accept the cultural norm. And then in Matthew chapter 5, that first chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, in verses 21, 27, 33, 38 and 43, he blows holes in their church. Everything they had thought about as church for a thousand years, all of their traditions, all of their assumptions. In each of those five verses, he starts by saying, you have heard it said. And often he quotes scripture. And then he follows that by saying, but I say to you, what? What scandalous talk is this? Who can this be to dare contradict everything we've come to believe came directly from the hand of God? To put it in our language, he's ruining our church. We were comfortable. We had it planned. Everybody was conformed. We understood how it all worked. And then this fella comes along, who is he, and says, that's what you've heard But this is what God wants. And this is what God is doing now. That was nothing less than revolutionary. He staked out a position. And then he calls us to join the minority. Join the small group. Because he's never relied. Jesus has never relied on huge numbers of horses, chariots, swords, or even people. In fact, in the Old Testament, David, King David, was severely punished for numbering the people, doing a census in a year in which he was not supposed to. (coughs) There were years you were supposed to. And he failed to do that one. 
And then later he did one in the year you weren't supposed to. So it, it just, that was enough for God. Why was it a sin to number the people like this? Because God didn't want them to rely upon the number of, we'll go modern, missiles you've got. The number of soldiers you've got. He wants you to rely upon him. That's why when he took over Egypt and ruined their slavery system, he did so with an 80-year-old man with a stick. It was to prove, I don't need anything else. I just need you to show up. By the way, history has shown us time and time again that the minority, when motivated, moves the majority. We've seen that in the Revolutionary War. In America, whenever the, the colonists decided to overthrow a perfectly good king, uh, he was, yes, completely insane, but we were used to it. Only 30% of the colonists ever, and that was a high point, ever supported the revolution. 30%. But that's all it took. The Bolshevik revolution, less than 20% ever supported it. How about our current revolutions attacking sexual norms? The things which are now so ingrained in our culture that if you say, I disapprove, you lose your job, you lose your office if you're a politician, you are hounded out of public life. 15 years ago, nobody believed. Nobody. And the group that everybody is supposed to be bowing down to and ignoring biology, ignoring tradition, ignoring the teachings of religious groups, whether Jewish, Muslim, or Christian, for a thousand years and more, make up less than 3% of the population. When you put them all together, less than 3%. Revolutions are not started by majorities. It's time for Christians to have a revolution. Right. Not in politics. You don't, you're, not, you're not going to overcome the pigsty by starting your own. Not by war. Not by writing columns, attacking people. No. It is by living the life Christ has called you to live where you are around the people you see and treating them as Christ would treat them. And when people ask you what you believe, tell them and tell them why. It'll be dangerous. It'll be dangerous. And no, you're not always going to do it terribly well. I didn't. I haven't. I've failed. Sometimes people have said something to me, and I've had the perfect comeback a day later. <laughs> I've, sometimes I've lost it. I'll never forget the time. I probably have told the story before. In university, where a teacher, I don't know what had happened with his porridge that morning, but he came in in a foul mood and was walking in attacking Christianity, attacking faith, attacking uh, any theism at all, just on a rant. It seemed like it went on forever, but it was probably just five or ten minutes. And when he was done, he said, did anybody have a problem with this? And I was as shocked as you to find out I'd raised my hand. That was not my intention. I had not told the hand to go up. The hand went up. He called on me, and I wish I could tell you that I laid out the argument, that I, I went toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, but no, I turned into sheep boy. It was like, well, uh, I, and it was just <laughs> fell apart. But God can use even scared college sophomores. He can use you. We don't have to be a jerk about it. We, what we say, the Bible says, speak the truth in love. The leader of this revolution, by the way, claimed authority. Matthew chapter 7, same sermon. Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29. The people were shocked by all of this. And they turned to each other and they said, this guy's not like the other teachers we've had. He teaches as if he has authority to say these things. Yeah, he does. An authority to upend the norm. An authority to change a whole look, the whole feel, the whole sound of church. To upend what they thought marked them as God's people. And to tell them they got it wrong. That that had brought them up. It wasn't, those books aren't bad. Those books were perfect to lead them to Jesus. 
But now they needed to listen to Jesus. When the colonists rebelled against Great Britain, one of the, great, one of the reasons that the rebellion started was the outrageous taxes levied upon the people in the American colonies without their consent. Some of those taxes approached 2%. And that was just intolerable. So the colonists raised up. I want to bring in this as a point. There's something about revolutions. If you forget why you had one, you, all of the benefits go away. You have to remember why you did it, or you'll end up worse than you were. Most of us are taxed more than 2%, aren't we? Now, I would be absolutely opposed to taking arms against the government. I don't believe that that's any way acceptable, period. What I'm saying is, we tend to forget. So, the Civil War came in, and an income tax was put in in America. Then, it went away for a while. Then it came and stayed, and there was no revolution and in fact, not only do you have to pay it, you have to do all the bookkeeping. You have to do all the, the record keeping. You have to pour in all the hours. Well, I don't. My wife does. Because she doesn't want to be audited too many times. She does it to, so it'll be, she's, she's all about make it accurate. So <laughs> my point is this. Revolutions fail if they're not remembered and the reasons for the revolution are forgotten. If the memories fade away, how will we maintain the goals of the revolution? When civics in grade school through high school vanished, as it has in almost all schools, we lost touch with what being a citizen meant and how government should work and what we should do when it doesn't work. When statues and markers are taken down because they remind us of bits of history we don't want to be reminded of, or when vast swaths of literature and history are erased because it's not convenient to remember them, the goals of earlier revolutions are forgotten and ground is lost. I want to give you some examples of this. Now, for those of our viewers, and we have so many who are outside of the Americas, I'm going to use a very American-centric set of examples from here on out. But I believe that they are transferable to your culture, whether you are in Tanzania, Spain, Russia, or Singapore. And yes, we have listeners and viewers from all of those. Uh, the podcast uh, data came out again this month, and I believe Singapore was second, Spain was third, there's Russia in there. It's just amazing. So apply this to your countries. The American Civil War was fought over many things, but to, to, for some people will say it wasn't fought over slavery is ridiculous. The history is quite plain. Slavery was the, the powder keg that set this off. 620,000 Americans lost their lives. That's 6% of the population. 6% of the population today would be 6 million people if that helps you understand the devastating loss. After the Civil War, American blacks were freed from slavery and they had access to power. About 2,000, within a few years, 2,000 held state or federal offices. 16 African Americans were elected to Congress. Both senators from Mississippi were black. Did you know that? They took full use of this freedom, and yay, it was a wonderful thing. And then a war on truth and history gained political power, and Reconstruction ended, Jim Crow began, and all the revolution's gains were lost when Woodrow Wilson, an avowed and open racist, became president. He went to work immediately making interracial marriage illegal, demoting or firing all black employees of the civil service. This was a president of the United States, segregating the civil service for the first time since the Civil War. 
making cabinet members segregate their workforces after demoting or firing their black employees. It was President Wilson who brought us separate wash basins, separate bathrooms, separate fountains, separate restaurants, real estate, and more. One black clerk who could not, because of the nature of his work, be segregated from his co-workers was placed in an actual cage to satisfy federal mandates. Employee, employers rather, were required to have a photo attached to every resume to make sure black people weren't hired for jobs reserved for whites. That happened within 55 years of the end of the Civil War. And all black members of Congress and the Senate disappeared. Think about that. Think, even by the standards of his day, Wilson was racist. But his, quote, reforms would continue until after the Civil Rights Act of 1968. And the legacy of this counter-revolution remained today. Think about all those people who died in the Civil War. And it just took a few decades to undo what was done. Literally, workers in a cage. And recently... Someone running for president described herself as a Wilsonian progressive. And I'm going, you don't know Wilson. What are you saying? Because we've erased so much history. Most people who are listening to this don't know about this. Go read a book. Even books that like him will tell you all of this. Revolutions forgotten are goals lost. Jesus stripped believers of a temple-centric worship. In fact, he made believers the new temples. He stripped away the priesthood of the law and made all believers priests. And yet, 2,000 years later, many, many churches are still trying to make their building a temple where you can only do certain things in there in certain ways and to make church leadership or priesthood the function of a few, not the body of believers. Jesus stripped away the long, long descriptions of demands of worship and replaced them, well, with no description at all. There exists no description of a worship service or the term worship service in the New Testament. He told us that God was to be worshipped in spirit and in truth, loved with all of our hearts, souls, minds, strength, and to love God and love our neighbors ourselves. And friends, that's enough commandments to keep us busy. If we forget this and run back to the temple in any form, the revolution is lost. We were warned not to forget this. As Maggie read for us today in Galatians chapter 5, just incredible things that he said. He said, the only thing that matters, or in the NIV, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. Friends, that's enough. That requires courage. It requires the willingness to be marked by society and be disinvited from parties or from speaking or from jobs. There were some in Galatia who wanted to turn this new community of faith back into a temple-based community with all of its procedures and traditions. By the way, if you're not a church person much and you don't know about the theology and Maggie was reading there about circumcision and you're thinking, well, wait, it says if, if people have been circumcised, everything's lost to them. It doesn't mean you. What he was referring to was if you require it as religious obligation, you've missed the entire point of Jesus Christ. But people missed the location. They missed the ceremonies. They miss the order, the predictability. I get that. I really do. And I don't believe that buildings are sinful. I don't believe that liturgies are sinful at all. As long as we understand that's not the revolution. Even though that may heal our souls, and that's important. And even though that may help us with community, which is also important. Our duty before God is not going to a building and doing rituals. Our duty to God is to encourage each other to then go out and be Jesus in the world. To be salt and light. To be disruptive, but also to be comforting. As some preachers describe their, 
job as afflicting the comfortable and comforting the afflicted. That's pretty much what we do. Paul warned them that this attitude in Galatians 5, 9 would destroy the entire revolution if we didn't get our minds back on freedom in Christ. Anyone who knows American history well has to admit that we've fallen far from the ideals of the intentions of the Emancipation Proclamation, of the Civil Rights Act. And anyone who knows religious history know that we need to once again become iconoclast revolutionaries, not with guns, but with noncompliance. Starting with our own idols, which is what most of you thought this sermon was going to be about. But it's bigger than that. We have to start on our personal idols, but also make sure that our culture, our ways, our church, our community are not idols to us. We will not bow. We will not resort to violence or any act of power grabbing. We just won't do what the world says. We will live as Christians. As Jesus said about himself in Matthew eleven seventeen to 19, He said, you don't like me because I don't dance when you play the tune and I don't mourn when you tell me to. Be like Jesus. Be in this world. Love everyone. Serve and share with everyone. But don't be like everyone. Holly, could you come on back up to the stage, please? Like salt and light, move in this world and have an effect on it with everybody have an effect on everybody you come into contact with just as he did Jesus the revolutionary our lord and messiah has called us to break the idols down it's time to join in it's time to be a dangerous people again may god bless us as we consider how to live more truthfully more honestly more honorably and more courageously for him.